Hi, everyone. My name is Ty Danae Bradley. I'm a mathematician and a postdoc currently at X the Moonshot Factory. And for the next few minutes, I'd like to share a few ideas on linear algebra for machine learning. So what's this talk really about? I just want to give a bird's eye view of basic ideas from linear algebra that appear in the context of machine learning. So this will be more of an introductory level talk. So if you've never taken linear algebra before, or if you know a little bit about the basics, vectors, matrices, and so on, and you want to get a feel for how they're used in machine learning, then this video is for you. In particular, this won't be a technical deep dive. So I won't do a lot of computations or calculations or rigorous proofs of theorems, but rather just give an overview sort of informally of some of the ideas you might see here. And my primary goal really is just to whet your appetite to learn more. So what actually is on the agenda for today? So there are a lot of things that we could discuss, but I've chosen three topics that I think will be useful that appear a lot in machine learning and also can be a segue to discuss the ideas in linear algebra. And those topics are data representations, vector embeddings, and dimensionality reduction. Now, if you've never heard of these terms before, or you have, but you aren't really sure what they mean, that's okay. That's what this talk is about. And I'd really like to use these ideas in machine learning as a vehicle to discuss the basic linear algebra behind them. So let's start with the first one first. So data representations, what do I mean here? Well, I mean the answer to the very simple question of how can we represent data like images or text and language or user preferences in a way that computers can understand. Now, if you try to think of the answer to this question, maybe the first thing that might come to mind is, well, computers understand numbers really well. So maybe there's something like that involved. And indeed there is. So here's the big idea behind data representation in the context of this talk. One simply organizes information into a vector. So that's the first basic idea from linear algebra that I'd like to discuss. Probably you're already familiar with this term, but just to make sure that everyone is on the same page. Um, when I say the word vector, I really just have in mind a one-dimensional array of numbers. Or maybe you've heard someone say that a vector is something with a magnitude or a length and a direction. So sometimes we like to indicate vectors by directed arrows. Now, that's a little bit of terminology. Um, another terminology you'll, you'll hear is a term called a vector space. So if you consider the totality of all vectors, one-dimensional arrays with, say, three numbers, three entries in them, this is called a three-dimensional vector space. Or you can think of all one-dimensional arrays with, you know, seven entries. That's called a seven-dimensional vector space. Now, in the context of machine learning, you'll hear similar words used. So one word you might hear is something called a feature vector. A feature vector is simply a vector whose entries you can interpret as representing, say, features of some object. So you might hear the word feature vector. Don't think of that, oh, that's a vector with a particular property. No, no, no. It's just a vector whose numbers represent something that you might be interested in. So my little example here on this slide is maybe I have a patient and I've, I'm keeping track of their height, weight, and age. So I'm just listing these numbers in my array. And these are sort of like the features of something that I'm interested in. Now, another term that you might hear in the context of machine learning is feature space. And that's sort of synonymous with vector space. So the totality of all vectors or feature vectors, that's sometimes called feature space. All right, I've given this example, which maybe is coming from something like, you know, maybe I have medical information that I'm interested in, but let me give you other common examples of data representations as vectors that appear in machine learning. What are some things you might see? The first one is images, which we mentioned a little while ago. If I have an image, how do I get a vector out of that? How can I represent that as a vector, a one-dimensional array of numbers? Well, it's pretty easy. Imagine you have a black and white image. You can associate to your black and white pixels numbers, zero or one, indicating black or white. Or you can think maybe you have a grayscale image, 
you can still associate to each pixel a number, say between 0 and 255. So under this identification of pixels to numbers, you can actually represent your image as a 0, 1 valued matrix, like I have here on the slide. Now, how do you get a vector out of this? Well, one thing you can imagine is sort of unzipping the matrix. You know, think of taking the first row and then stacking it on top of the second row, sort of vertically, and then stacking that on top of the third row and so on. So that's one way to start with a picture and to get a vector out of it. That's one thing you might see. Um, but what's another example? That's images. Maybe on the other hand, you might be interested in something like text or words and documents. So you can imagine you have a whole bunch of articles, maybe from Wikipedia, and you want to represent the words in those articles by vectors. Here's one thing you can do. How do I get numbers from words and documents? Here's an idea. Suppose you have a word you're interested in like dog. You can count the number of times that dog appears in each of your articles, and then just list those counts in a vector. So maybe dog appears no times in my first Wikipedia article, and so I put a zero in the first entry. Maybe it appears seven times in my second article, so I put a seven there, and so on. Now, um, you can imagine if you have lots and lots of articles, this will be a very large vector that lives in a very large dimensional vector space, um, but still something that you can do. All right, what about another example? Well, you can imagine a scenario now, maybe you have some users and some items, something like movies, and maybe you'd like to indicate whether your user um, has watched that movie, like a yes or no, or maybe that user has given that movie or that item that they've interacted with a rating, you know, say between zero and five. So you can take those ratings or take those yes or no, has this person interacted with this item and just assemble those into a vector as well. So maybe sort of list your movies, movie number one, movie number two, and so on. And then next to that movie, you can just stick the, the user's rating for that. So these are some common examples of how you can take data and represent them using uh, this basic idea of a vector from linear algebra. But there's something that all of these examples have in common and that they're just sort of inherently numerical. So what if you have non-numerical data like language and you know maybe you're interested in representing words but you don't necessarily have counts from documents. What's a way you might represent this kind of data? Well, another standard way to represent data, especially in cases like this uh, are called one hot encodings. So let's think about language, for example. And suppose I have a very, very small vocabulary. You know, I just know four words, apple, cat, house, and tiger. So apple goes first, cat second, maybe I list them alphabetically. So what you can do is associate to each vector uh, one hot encoding or a vector with a whole bunch of zeros except for one one. And that one one appears in the first place, the first entry of your vector for the first word apple. And it appears in the second entry for my second word cat. It appears in the third entry for my third word house and so on. So these are called one hot encodings in machine learning or if you come from a mathematics background, these are uh, also called standard basis vectors. So that's something simple you can do. I mean, you can imagine having something like tens of thousands of words rather than just four. And now you can start to see we have vectors with lots and lots and lots of zeros, except for one entry, which is a one. So this now makes us think of some drawbacks to data representations. So the one I was alluding to now is sparsity. In other words, data representations can be very sparse or have lots and lots of zeros. Um, I just gave an example now of one hot encodings. We can also think back to users and movies, right? Maybe I have something like 500,000 users and a million movies. Um, probably not every user has watched every movie. And so I have lots of unknown uh, entries in my vectors. And maybe I just you know, replace those unknown entries or unknown ratings with zeros. There's probably lots of them. So that's one drawback to consider. Another uh, possible drawback of data representations is that they may lack meaningful relationships between them. So in particular, let's just think about one hot encodings for language, 
for a second. Um, I'm going to go back to the previous slide. And we sort of have this intuitive feel that cats and tigers are similar. Uh, they're more closely related than, say, cats and apples. And you would like that intuition to carry over into your linear algebra. But if you do a one-hot encoding, it's actually not true. Um, you don't get that similarity um, that you'd like to see there. Now, how? why am I saying this? How do I know this? Well, there's another operation in linear algebra called the dot product. And that is a, um, a nice way to understand similarity between vectors. And when you use this dot product, you can sort of see that one hot encodings are never similar in the way that we'd like them to be. So uh, you could just take my word for it, but actually this is a really nice concept in linear algebra. So I'd like to take a, a little detour and explain what's this dot product and how does it relate to similarity and why is this an indicator of you know, possible drawbacks to consider? So let's take a quick detour. What's the dot product? Well, just like we can multiply numbers, we can also multiply vectors. That's what's called what I'm calling the dot product. Now, um, what is this really? Well, here's one way to think about this. Of course, if I take two numbers, I multiply them together, I get another number, sure. Now imagine you start with not numbers, but you start with two vectors. There's a way to multiply them and get not another vector, but actually a number. So I get something that's a little bit different than what I started with. And that number that you get is like a similarity measure or an indicator of how similar the vectors you started with are to one another. How do you get this number? Well, there's an algebraic formula. Maybe let me not give it to you exactly. I'll just put a little example on, on the screen. So if I have two vectors that both have you know, three entries or some fixed number of entries that have to be the same, how do I get a number out of them? Well, what you do is you multiply the first two numbers together and you add them to the product of the second two numbers. And then you add that to the product of the third numbers and you know so on if I have n entries in my vectors. So I've described that in words, but hopefully you can sort of see the pattern by my color coding on the screen. And you add those, those numbers up and then you get a number and that's the dot product. Now, what is this, you know, what does this number represent? Well, I'm saying it's something like how similar the two vectors are to each other. And how can you see that? Well, here's the intuition. Um, maybe a visual way that you can think about this number that you get. I, I like to think of the dot product is like a shadow of one vector onto the other. So, you know, earlier we were thinking of vectors as one dimensional arrays or as, as arrows or directed arrows. So you can imagine I have one vector, call it V, and I sort of, you know, it's near another vector W. And what's the dot product? You can imagine taking a little flashlight, you see my cartoon there, and just shining it down and asking, what is the shadow of my vector V on the other vector W? What's the length of that shadow? Now it turns out the answer is the dot product, that number, in the case when the length of W is one, but let's not get into that right now. It's, you know, if it's not one, then it's proportional to the dot product. So the idea is that the dot product is like a measure of how long a shadow is of one vector lying in the direction of another. So this follows from basic trigonometry. You can find an explanation you know, in your uh, favorite linear algebra book or on other resources online. But that's sort of the intuition. So why are we talking about this? Oh yeah, because dot products measure similarity. And now you can see if you take the dot product between one hot encodings that represent words like apple and cat, you, you get zero. And actually, you know, maybe that's okay because apples and cats are kind of not really related. But you also get zero if you take the dot product between tiger and cat. And maybe you don't really want that because you sort of feel that they're more similar than, say, you know, apples and cats. So that's one of the drawbacks to these kind of data representations. And it motivates this idea that we want to choose representations wisely. So I've given you some main examples, but there are some drawbacks to consider. And so if there's a problem, you know, what's the solution? Well, look for a better way to do it.
look for better vector representations. And that leads us to our second topic, namely vector embeddings. So what's the big idea behind vector embeddings? Well, simply put, an embedding of one vector is simply another vector that replaces it, but which lies in a smaller dimensional vector space. Um, maybe a little cartoon might be helpful. What I have is a vector with n entries, and I want to replace it with another vector with a fewer number of entries. Now, in my uh, cartoon here, I'm replacing a three-dimensional vector by a two-dimensional one. You know, in reality, um, we'd have something much larger than three, and we'd go down to something much smaller than that number. But I just want to use this because, um, you know, you can sort of think of the ground or the floor that you're sitting on or standing on right now as a two-dimensional space that's embedded in this larger ambient three-dimensional space in which we live. And so that's where the word sort of comes from. So the idea is replacing a data representation, a vector that you have, by one that lives in a smaller dimensional space and which is meaningful and hopefully overcomes some of the drawbacks that we mentioned a little while ago. So how do people go about doing this in practice? Well, let me uh, discuss with you at least two ways. Number one, matrix factorizations. And I'll briefly mention a second way, neural networks. So. What's all this about matrix factorizations? Um, what does this concept really mean? Well, to discuss it, we first have to talk about matrices. So earlier we said that a vector is a one-dimensional array of numbers, and a matrix is just the next step up from that. It's a two-dimensional array of numbers. But much more than that, a matrix represents a process of turning one vector into another. You can imagine you know, stretching a vector or rotating it or scaling it or something more complex. Now, I've uh, drawn this sort of uh, numerical algebraic uh, picture on the screen. And that's because there's a particular formula for multiplying matrices by vectors to get another vector. Let me not go over that formula. Um, you can, again, find that in, in, in a linear algebra textbook or in other resources online. But I mention it just to know that there is a way. And that process um, is what I'm referring to here. But much more than just being a sort of granular concept, a matrix takes one vector and outputs another one. It's much larger than that. You should think of a, of a matrix as a transformation of an entire vector space into another one. So. If one vector moves, maybe I've taken my before picture, there's my orange vector on the screen, I apply this matrix to it, and it gets sent to this purple vector on the right. But more than just that one vector moving, all vectors surrounding it move as well, according to the rules defined by this matrix. Now, that's a little bit hard to visualize on a slide, but kind of have to use your imagination for this. So that's uh, matrices. But what is this? idea of matrix factorization. Even if this concept or this phrase is new, I think the idea is familiar. And to see this, let's think back to numbers. Earlier, we were talking about multiplication. So you can take two numbers, multiply them, and get another number. We also talked about a way to take two vectors and multiply them and also get a number. Analogously, there's a way to take two matrices, multiply them together, and get actually not a number, but a matrix out of them. And that's simply matrix multiplication. Now, again, there's a, a very um, specific algebraic formula for how this is done. Let me not go, go through it. Um, there is this sort of idea that to multiply two matrices, you want to make sure that the number of columns of your first matrix matches the number of rows of your second matrix. That's just so the math works out nicely. Um, but just know there's a way to take two matrices and do some arithmetic and get another matrix as a result. And we view that output as the product of the two matrices we started with, just like multiplying numbers. But what's this talk about factorization? Well, you know, if I have, you know, three numbers, I can multiply them and look at their product, but you can also go in the other direction. If someone gives you a number like 540, you can say, hey, what are three numbers so that if I multiply them, I get 540. So that idea of undoing multiplication, that's the idea behind factorization. And the point is that this concept holds for matrices also. 
If I start with some matrices, maybe I have three of them like on the left, I can do this formula and multiply them together and get another matrix. But you can imagine someone giving you a matrix and asking, hey, are there matrices, say smaller quote unquote matrices, such that when I multiply them, I get the matrix that I started with? This sort of doing multiplication in reverse, this is the idea behind matrix factorization. Now, just know that in general, in mathematics, factorization is hard. You can sort of see that it's a lot easier to multiply numbers than it is to try to go in the other direction and factor them. In fact, all of modern cryptography is based on the difficulty of factorization. But what we can say, at least in the context of linear algebra, actually every matrix can be factored. This is a fundamental theorem in linear algebra and the factorization has a name. It's called the singular value decomposition decomposition being sort of synonymous with factorization. So here's, here's the, the result. Any matrix, let's say it has N rows and M columns, so that's an N by M matrix we say, can be written as a product of three smaller matrices. Now, these matrices are actually themselves very special. They have really nice properties. Um, they're not just sort of arbitrary, but they, they are, they're very nice and they relate to the original matrix that we started with in a principal way. Now, the terminology for why they're so nice is a little bit outside the scope of this course. Um, one of the matrices in the middle, you can see I labeled it as a diagonal matrix. And the other two matrices have this nice property that their columns or rows are vectors of length one and that the dot product between any two of them is zero. That property is called orthonormality. Now, if that's not familiar, don't worry. Just know that any matrix can be written as a product of three smaller matrices, and in fact, they're really nice. And this all has a nice geometric picture behind it if, you're, uh, if you like visual uh, ways to think of things. That's something um, to look at if you are interested. I, I will say singular value decomposition, or SVD, appears all throughout the scientific landscape. So not only is it a fundamental result of linear algebra, it appears in lots of places, not just machine learning, but even in statistics, physics, genomics, robotics, lots of places. If you're interested, I can't uh, resist sharing this wonderful paper, The Extraordinary SVD by Martin and Porter in 2012. Do take a look. But why am I mentioning this though? You know, what are we, what are we talking about here? Well, we were talking about matrix factorizations in the context of vector embeddings. I have a data representation of my, uh, I have a vector which is a data representation. And I want sort of a better version of it, a better version of this vector. And I'm claiming that matrix factorization is a way to do this. How is that true? Well, I'll tell you the punchline up front. Your vector embeddings are given by the rows or columns of the matrices in your factorization. So you can sort of imagine, maybe I start with a vector with, say, five entries. That's the orange row on the left. And I look at a factorization of this matrix that I'm starting with, and I look at the corresponding, say, third row of one of my matrices. It has fewer entries. That new vector is going to be thought of as the candidate for my embedding of the original orange vector that I started with. That's kind of the idea, but maybe it's getting a little bit murky because, huh, what's really going on? Can we see an example? Well, yeah, let's look at an example to make these ideas more concrete. And in particular, let's think back to users and movies, an idea we talked about a little while ago. Now, this example, um, I really like this example and the images uh, that accompany it. Um, I've taken them from Google Developers Machine Learning Crash Course on Collaborative Filtering. So for more on this, do check out that link. Uh, it's really, really insightful. But I'll just give you the high-level version. So let's imagine we have a matrix whose rows are indexed by people and whose columns are indexed by movies. And let's imagine putting a check mark in a cell if that user has watched that movie. Now, if the user hasn't watched that movie, we won't put anything there. Maybe we'd like to think of check marks as ones and empty cells as either zeros, or you can use negative numbers depending on the application you have in mind. But here's a matrix we're going to start with. 
and eventually we'll be interested in a factorization of this matrix. But before we get there, let me just point out a fact that connects this to our discussion earlier. This matrix gives me sort of naive representations of my users in movies. For example, I can represent user number three, that third row, by a vector, namely just corresponding to the entries in that third row, say 11100 or check, 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 empty, empty. Um, I can do this for each of my users. And similarly, I can obtain vectors for my movies. Maybe Shrek is 1010 corresponding to the third column of that matrix. But what we were saying for this part of the talk is that we'd really like vector embeddings that know something about the features and the data that we're interested in. And this is something to observe. There are features. I don't know if you can tell from the images, but we'd like to think that maybe some of our users are kids and others of them are adults. Um, you can see that some of the movies are geared more for a younger audience and some of them are geared for an older audience. And in fact, some of the movies on the screen are more blockbuster movies and others are more art house. So we have all of these features lying around and the upshot is we'd like to represent these data by vectors that know something about these features. So looking ahead, the goal really is to find a single vector space, let's just say two-dimensional for simplicity, that can capture these features well. Um, these features are sometimes called latent features, or this vector space is called a latent space. These are sort of features that are hidden in your data, and you'd like to understand the mathematics well enough so that it sort of brings them to light. So you can sort of imagine maybe one dimension, uh, maybe the horizontal dimension is picking up the age brackets that we're interested in. And then maybe my vertical dimension is picking up whether my movies are, are blockbuster or more art house. And I'd like to find representations of my users and movies that such that when I plot them on this plane, um, the representations correspond to the features that I observe in my data. That's kind of the goal. And how do we go about doing this? That's exactly where matrix factorization comes in. So what you can do is use singular value decomposition or other techniques that are like it or inspired by it to find two smaller matrices. I'll call them U and V. Um, that V with a subscript T just represents transpose, which is sort of like taking a matrix and uh, rotating it on its side. So you want to find two smaller matrices, U and V, so that when you take their product, it approximately gives you back the matrix that you started with. And the point is that the rows and columns of these two matrices are precisely the candidates for your vector embeddings. Now, again, what, what, okay, I'm telling you this, but like, what does this really mean? Can we see what this means concretely? Yeah. Let's actually start with the matrix. Uh, our user by movie matrix. And now from the Google uh, developers crash course, here are two matrices, U and V, I've marked them out, that were sort of um, handcrafted specifically for this example. So I know that there's a lot going on on the right-hand side. Let's sort of ignore the colors and everything for right now, and just think of my U matrix and my V matrix as what I would get from uh, SVD-like factorization. I'm saying that the columns and rows are candidates. What does that mean exactly? Again, a lot of information on the screen, so let's just zoom in onto two examples. You remember my vector representation for user number three was a vector with five entries, 11100. One, one, but the new candidate vector, my new vector embedding, is just a vector with two entries, and I've highlighted it here, 0.2, negative 1. Likewise, our original vector for Shrek was 1010. That's my orange column on the left. But now through this matrix factorization, my new candidate vector, my embedding, is just this vector with two entries, 1, negative 1. That's sort of the numerical picture, but what does this really look like? How do we know that this is the right thing? Because if I plot these vectors on my two-dimensional space, you can see that Shrek and user number three are pretty close together. And if we're imagining that user number three is a young child, maybe that makes sense because Shrek uh, is a movie that appeals to a younger audience. 
And so these two vectors are kind of similar. And there's a nice principled way to see that, namely through the dot product. So you can even imagine shining a flashlight you know, of the blue vector and looking at its shadow on the orange. It's a pretty large shadow. They're pretty close together. And so that pairs well with our intuition that, yeah, kids probably like the movie Shrek. And so the linear algebra gives a nice way to obtain these vector embeddings. And this matrix factorization is one way to do that. Now, I mentioned another way, and that's through neural networks. I'll just give you the Cliff Notes version because it's a little bit outside the scope of linear algebra. But let me just say, um, another way to get a vector embedding is through a neural network. So what that means is you can start with your original sort of naive data representation vector, feed it into this box called a neural network, and the output will be another vector, which will again be your candidate for an embedding. Now, if you look under the hood of this neural network, you will find matrix, a matrix. In fact, you might find lots and lots of them, but you'll also find other things that now take us outside of the scope of linear algebra, and this really leads into the world of deep learning. So I only mention it uh, because it's good to know in the context of vector embeddings, neural networks are one option. And as we discussed uh, previously, matrix factorizations are as well. Now, in either uh, case, just to wrap up this part of the talk, the goal is the same. You'd like to compress your high dimensional data into a smaller dimensional, more meaningful subspace. But let me mention, you'd like to do this in a way that doesn't lose too much information, right? Anytime you're compressing, you're losing information. So you want to make sure you do this wisely. And this actually brings us into the larger discussion of dimensionality reduction. And that's what's next on our agenda. Now, in machine learning, there are a number of different dimensionality reduction techniques. For this talk, I'd like to use this topic as a way to introduce a, another concept from linear algebra, and namely that of eigenvectors. So the idea behind this uh, portion, dimensionality reduction, is to find these things called eigenvectors, or maybe something that you're familiar with, principal components. So I'll explain this in a second. Let me first say what, what an eigenvector is. Now, you'll recall we said that a matrix represents a transformation between vector spaces. But no, there are some transformations for which a vector will never change direction, but it's only scaled. So it'll grow or shrink in size, but under the transformation, it will never change its direction. Vectors with that, that property have a special name. They're called eigenvectors. And the amount by which an eigenvector is scaled is called its eigenvalue. So on the screen, I've showed what that kind of looks like algebraically. I have a matrix, let's call it M. I multiply it by another, by a vector, call it V. And if I observe that the output is exactly what I started with, namely V, but maybe multiplied by some scalar like two, then we say that V is an eigenvector for M and two is the eigenvalue. Now, this uh, slide does not do this concept justice. It's very visual. So in particular, I would highly recommend checking out Three Blue, One Brown's, uh, Grant Sanderson's video, Eigenvectors and Eigenvalues. And at the 239 timestamp, you'll see the animation that corresponds to this sort of stretching or scaling idea behind eigenvectors. Um, but this is sort of what it is in a nutshell. Now. The thing to know is that eigenvectors play an important role in linear algebra. That's really an entire talk on its own, so we won't go into too much detail. But I will say that in the context of data science and machine learning, in addition to having a nice visual understanding, eigenvectors also encode valuable information about your data. And let me share one example that ties this into our discussion of dimensionality reduction. So you can imagine having lots of points, say n data points, in some m-dimensional space. For simplicity on this slide, I'm supposing m is equal to 2. Now, oftentimes, you'll find that your data points are clustered along a line, say, or some other small dimensional space. And you'd like to know, what is that line? What is that subspace on which my data is clustered? You'd like to know this so that you can zoom in or hone in onto the smaller dimensional space and focus your resources there. 
It's kind of the idea behind reducing dimensions. So how do you find that? How do you find that line in this example? Here's sort of the bird's eye view of how this is done. What one first does is organize your data points into a matrix. So a data point, really you can think of that as a vector. Um, if your data lives in, uh, you know, in dimensional space, that's a vector within entries in it. And you can imagine stacking all of those vectors for each of your data points into a matrix. And so what one does is you look at the eigenvectors of not that matrix, but actually that matrix times itself or times its transpose. There's a reason for that. Um, really eigenvectors only make sense for square matrices. And so you have to sort of multiply your matrix by itself for that to work. There's a little bit more to this. I'm sort of sweeping things under the rug because now we're really into the territory of not just linear algebra, but also statistics. So you kind of have to maybe center your data points by subtracting off the mean of each row and then you know, divide the matrix by its transpose by some constant. That, that's sort of the statistics uh, aspects. But I just want to say, conceptually, you have data points that gives you a matrix. If you look at the eigenvectors, of that matrix multiplied by its transpose, then it turns out you'll find in these contexts that if you look at the eigenvector whose scaling factor is the largest, that is, that has the largest eigenvalue, that eigenvector points in the direction that your data is clustered along. So in this case of it being a line, that eigenvector tells you exactly the direction of that line. So this is called the principal direction of your data or the principal eigenvector. Um, and so, you know, much more than having this really nice geometric interpretation um, that we were discussing earlier about not or being invariant under a transformation, it also tells you something about inherent features of your data. Now, all of this discussion, it's I went through it pretty quickly, so know that it's uh, called principal component analysis. And if you'd like to understand more about this example in particular, I highly recommend um, Gilbert String's Introduction to Linear Algebra. So here's the takeaway uh, for that quick tour. The, the punchline is that oftentimes relevant data will occupy only a small portion of some larger ambient vector space. And you'd like to find a way to work in that smaller dimensional space that increases efficiency, it saves you resources, and it reveals relevant structure in your data. And the point is that linear algebra and other dimensionality reduction techniques can help you locate that smaller dimensional space. So that's a quick overview of how linear algebra appears in machine learning. Um, I hope the takeaway is that it's key, these ideas are key, but there's a lot more to explore. So I've mentioned some videos, papers, and books throughout the talk. So I highly recommend if you're interested, be sure to check those out. And to see these ideas in action, you can also take a look at the other videos in this series. So that's it for me. Thanks so much for your time. Mm -hmm.